Stuart. Hello, um, thank you. Um, Vanessa, can you put up my slides, please? And we will take a whirlwind tour through industrial conversion during the COVID-19 crisis. So um, next slide, um, we'll go straight into it. So cast your mind back to um, early March 2020 when COVID-19 was something that hardly anyone had heard of. Um, and we have a situation where the UK government um, realises the need for thousands of medical ventilators. These are devices to help critically ill patients breathe, um, those with um, COVID-19. And um, the modelling that the NHS did at that time revealed that there was a massive shortage looming, that they needed tens of thousands of these ma machines and, and, the, um, and the NHS only had about 7,000. So what happened was government held a conference call with hundreds of senior reps from UK industry. They put out a, a wider call through the internet and they set up this twin approach. So, okay, we can scale up the production of existing ventilator designs, or we can try and design and manufacture new devices. Um, and so there was a twin track, a twin track um, followed and um, and various industrial consortia were um, set up. Um, next slide, please. So I, I'm going to, the, in the next couple of slides, I'll, I'll illustrate some of these consortia. And, um, and on the first slide here, we've got the ones that did in the end end up supplying the NHS. So the biggest consortia was called the Ventilator Challenge UK. It had two approaches. Um, it took an existing model manufactured by a company called Penland and um, it modified the design so that it was more um, suitable for COVID-19 patients and um, scaled up that design. It also worked um, with Smith's Medical to, to um, modify one of their designs. Um, and over 30 companies directly involved, including some of the, the um, household names, Ford, Air, Airbus, and so on, um, and also uh, uh, a network of supporters and suppliers uh, um, just as big. And this was coordinated by um, the snappily titled High Value Manufacturing Catapult, which was uh, it's part of the Department of Business and Industry, and it helps new companies, it helps companies commercialize new products. Um, and they very quickly put together this team and um, various companies and, and I will talk more in depth about that one in, in shortly. Um, some of the other um, um, consortia uh, listed here, um, you've got Babcock for example. Babcock, Babcock is um, one of the UK's largest um, military technology companies. Um, it's involved in manufacturing um, the UK's new nuclear armed submarines. So um, not the first company you think um, when you think of medical ventilators but it teamed up with, with a medical company called Draeger and, and they also um, created a new ventilator or a modified ventilator. Um, so next slide please. Um, so there are also various consortia um, that pretty much followed the, the design something new route um, and in the end most of these were unsuccessful and you can see here a list of, of um, the key ones here and you can also see which companies were involved um, and again various medical companies but also a few companies that you wouldn't normally associate with um, medical technologies like BA Systems, Aston Martin, Red Bull Formula One team. Um, so yeah quite a few. So next slide. Um, so in this slide, what I've done is I've tried to summarize which sectors were involved in these various consortia. So in the middle column, there's um, um, the, the companies involved in the ventilator challenge, and I, I roughly categorize them according to which sectors they're in, and, and, and the right-hand column, um, the ones involved in other consortia. So you can see particularly um, surprisingly represented our motor racing companies, Formula One companies were um, heavily involved in this, military technology arms companies, um, and civil aviation um, were particularly well represented. Um, next slide. So to look in a bit more detail at the Ventilator Challenge UK consortium, what they did was, was as I say, they took the Penland um, basically de design of a ventilator 
and, and they modified it for COVID-19. Now, to give you an idea of, of how complex a ventilator is, there's a few numbers here about um, the number of parts involved, the number of supplies involved. The, one of the engineers involved in the um, production scheme said it, that they, these things are not quite as complex as a car. So it gives you an idea of the level of um, engineering um, complexity involved. And, and remember that these are medical equipments. They have to go through certification processes to check that they are suitable for treating patients. Um, and all this was done very quickly. So they rapidly ramped up production. First unit produced four weeks after the government call. Um, 12 weeks after that, they had 11,000 completed. So they were doubling production every few days. Um, it was really quite an impressive achievement. Um, and so the production volume was about 200 times what Penland was originally producing. Um, so, um, and, and they focused the, the manufacturing at four sites around the UK. So they converted um, Ford in Essex, Airbus in North Wales, McLaren um, in um, Surrey and SDI in Hampshire. So spread around the country, key engineering sites, um, around 1500 technical sites spread around these and um, quickly innovated and, and trained up engineers and technicians to work manufacturing components, assembling these things. Um, one of the innovative training methods they, they devised, and this remember this was during lockdown, this was when people were learning how to use PPE at work, um, they used um, what's called mixed reality headsets. So you've heard of virtual reality headsets, where well, these are headsets where you can see the outside world, but also superimposed on that. Um, you've got um, various technical um, images that help the engineers learn quickly how to manufacture new components, assemble new components. Um, so a, a lot of innovation there. Next slide, please. So, um, so yes, um, I went to a talk recently or, or watched a webinar recently by some of the engineers involved in this and they, they gave these reasons for success within the program. So key at, at the start is the shared social goal there. So there was a specific urgent health aim um, and that really helped focus minds, focus um, um, the people involved in the situation to, to get um, organized very quickly. They're able to um, quickly make use of high quality manufacturing sites, um, technical staff, quality control standards that already existed in the UK and, and had a strong willingness to innovate. Um, and there was a remarkable amount of collaborative working um, close cooperation between regulators, businesses, trade unions, between businesses that normally don't work together, normally in competition with each other, a very flat management structure that they, they founded very quickly, and um, importantly, data sharing between all the businesses and governments. So there was no um, data, no um, data was not private, um, so, and, and that was um, very important. And, and a simple relationship with the government, with the customer. So um, and in some ways, really quite socialist and not typical of um, UK industry. Um, so next slide. Um, but there are a number of caveats or interesting um, observations that I want to make, which I'll, I'll develop more in a minute. Um, Although this was a, a remarkable engineering program and, and the, um, um, the production was ramped up really fast, um, it's, they still managed to miss all the production targets that the government set if the um, casualty rate was going to be as high as the worst, worst case scenario. Luckily it wasn't or not luckily because other measures were put in place, but it, it, it kind of showed you even at this rapid rate, um, they were missing targets by quite a wide margin. Um, and of the over 20,000 new ventilators that they were manufactured through these schemes, uh, the NHS only ended up using just over 2,000 of them. And the rest are, are um, as far as I can find out, are still sitting in a Ministry of Defence storage depot. So tremendous engineering challenge, but um, a rather disappointing use in practice. And, and another aspect of this was that the ventilators, while they were produced in large quantities actually didn't turn out to be useful than other machines called CPAP machines. So these were smaller, 
um, less intrusive machines and, and, and cheaper as well. And, and these were much more widely used by the NHS and found to be more useful for treating COVID-19 patients. So, and there was a parallel um, program to scale up production of these and, and the most successful consortium in that was again involved um, a Formula One company, Mercedes Formula One with um, University College London. Um, and then very sadly, at the end of production, everything was shut down. Oh, companies and workers re returned to original activities in many cases. So Formula One um, um, just restarted and the engineers went back and worked on that and, and car companies and, and to an extent aviation companies, although um, they were hit by COVID-19, so, so less there. But the opportunities for long-term transition, I, th I think, were um, sadly missed on this. Um, and of course, actually what really did bring that down the casualty rates and what really did save most of the lives was actually the wider behavior changes in society. So all the physical distancing, hand washing, face masks, and, and that was what saved most lives. Um, so um, next slide, please. On, on my final slide, trying to draw together some um, lessons for the climate emergency. Um, key thing here is, is kind of obvious, early action to tackle a crisis avoids a lot of wasted effort. Though um, the, the engineers did a remarkable job, um, it, it was a lot less useful than, than if, it, if, if um, more work had been um, carried out earlier to um, have, have more ventilators in stock, for example, before, um, as, as um, previous governments' reports had, had um, encouraged governments to do. Um, and um, but a, another key thing is that industry can innovate very rapidly for social environmental goals if there are sufficient incentives and um, and here we had very strong incentives government and, and wider public incentives and, and fossil fuel dependent industries like cars and planes industries were able to, to switch production extremely quickly and extremely effectively. And, and that's an important lesson there. And if the government creates those incentives and has the political will to do that, then, then that, that um, can, can start things off very well. Collaborative working is very important and, and the, the potential here, I think is shown very well by the ventilator challenge scheme. And, and the final point, um, which is often lost in debates around climate change, is that arms conversion can be a very effective way of transferring skills and resources to help tackling the climate emergency and moving those into sectors like renewable energy. Global military spending is currently about $2 trillion a year, and that is, a, and that is mainly because of the um, nationalistic arms races that we're seeing, um, uh, with, driven by countries like the USA. And, and Russia and China, um, and it's a terrible waste of, of, um, of resources there. So um, that's an opportunity that, that we, we need to make use of in the climate emergency. Thank you. Stuart, thank you so much. Um, it's all been so absolutely riveting and so rich and full of detail and example that it's